So I'll be talking to you about fatty liver disease. So before that, let me thank Karishma, Snehal, and the other two members who have joined the TTS team for this wonderful opportunity. This has been a long pending project of mine, but today I'm so excited to share about fatty liver disease with all of you. So here is a picture. So the whole next 40 to 50 minutes, what um, I'll be talking to you all about. So before that, let me tell you one important thing. So couple of slides, four to five slides, I'll be sharing with you about uh, the information. We'll have a quiz in between. So let's see who's going to answer first and how well you're going to answer it. And of course, obviously, based on the other TTA's videos, uh, which I'm familiar of, you'll be asking and putting in your question in the chat box and I'll be answering it. Okay. With that said, let's begin today's session. Uh, next slide. So before talking to you about fatty liver disease, let me introduce you to the organ liver. It's an amazing organ, not just because I'm working on it, because as you see throughout the talk, you will understand how amazing it is, how wonderfully it functions, how vital it is to the human body. So if you see the figure here, liver, which is located in the right part, upper abdominal cavity, it is just beneath or above the stomach, pancreas, and the intestine. As you see here, the shape is cone shape or wedge shape. A healthy human liver in the adult weighs about three pounds. So the color of the healthy liver is, is reddish brown in color, as you see in the picture. So it's a very vital organ. I say this because in the further slides, you will understand how important it is. Why is it important? Okay, let's see what are the functions that it carries out. So here you go. Liver is an all-rounder. That is how it is termed as because it is known to function more than 500 functions. That's how the textbook describes it. Here are the very key functions of the liver. Okay, so first if you see it stores glucose. So before I begin explaining how many of you have you I've come across the function of the liver. Can, anybody, can anyone put in the chat box? What are the functions of the liver that you are familiar of? That makes my job easy. Okay. I can. So Devia, we, we do have some entries in the chat window. Ala says she has encountered the functions. Uh, Abhishek says it stores sugar. Sugars. Okay. Bhargavi says it produces saliva. I'm not sure uh, about that, not, but Ala no. also says it produces bile. bile. Says Ala, it okay. produces bile. Yeah, that's so right. Okay. Two. Okay. So at least a few of you are familiar with the function. Let me introduce you to more functions of the liver, and that's why I say it is amazing. So here is the first function. As one of you mentioned, it stores glucose. The other thing, liver stores most of the vitamins in it. The most important role of liver is to convert sugar into glycogen. So whenever you're fasting, whenever there is a demand for extra energy, that comes from the liver where the stored glycogen will be converted back to glucose. So liver plays a key role in converting sugar into glycogen. The other very important role of liver is that it converts ammonia to urea, which is less toxic. Ammonia is highly toxic to the human body, and therefore liver plays a key role in converting ammonia to urea, which is then excreted and filtered through your kidney and goes through the urine. The, as Ala mentioned, it produces bile, a very important um, product because it is involved in all the fat uh, solubilization. So the more fat you take, bile is produced, and then it solubilizes the fat. The key role of liver is also that it detoxifies blood. When I say detoxification, more of the harmful products, the drugs that you take in, all these are being metabolized and made it into an not harmful or unharmful, non-harmful substance by the liver. So this is one of the detoxification process that is very, very critical, very important to the human body and play and makes liver a vital organ. The 
involved in protein synthesis. So most of the metabolism happens in the liver, be it carbohydrate metabolism, protein metabolism, or fat metabolism. Okay. So now moving on, knowing that, knowing all of the key functions of the liver, an analogy is liver is as a metabolic factory. So how many of you agree that liver is a metabolic factory or can be considered as a met metabolic factory? And looking at this figure, how many of you can relate it? Answers? So Ala says yes, she Ala. relates. What do you think this figure look? Anirudh says you can count me in. But uh, I do, says Avishay. What do you think this figure looks like? I mean, yeah, says Sayan. But what does this figure remind you of? Uh, if I had to say, Divya, I, I, yeah, exactly. Like that says, like a factory, like yes. an industry, you know, like some operating unit in an industry, doing lots of things at one time. One time, yes. That's an exact answer which I was looking for. I mean, a factory would have a warehouse. It has, you know, manufacturing happening. And at the same time, delivering of the manufactured product, you know, that is shipment. So all that is happening in the liver. So very aptly, you can say liver is a metabolic factory where it stores glucose and proteins and fats in the liver. There is toxin detoxification happening. It gets, you know, gets out of the liver what is toxic or to the human body shipping where the stored glucose or glycogen is, you know, um, transported into the circulation and supplied to the overall body. So, so what is very interesting, Divya, is the liver makes things as well as breaks things. Breaks things, yes. So I think that's a big takeaway, right? It makes protein, it makes vitamins, and it breaks toxins breaks, breaks. and breaks harmful chemicals like ammonia. Ammonia, that's right. Okay. So, so make it or break it is obviously a liver. So a liver came up with that. Liver, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So. I told you about all the amazing things liver do, but before that, let me, you know, explain you about the unique features of liver, which makes it very vital, very unique from 14% of the body blood at any given point. As I said, when you're fasting, you need glucose and there comes the liver. Yes, the body demands and then immediately the glycogen is converted to glucose and then you have the energy that is needed for the body. The most unique and a special feature of the liver is that it can regenerate. I'm sure most of you might have heard about transplantation. Yes? Yeah. Have you heard of transplantation? Some people have, yes. Okay, that's good. So transplantation, when you have to explain if it is kidney transplantation or a kidney donor, you have two kidneys, so one of it can be given, but you can't cut the liver, uh, kidney into pieces and then give it to another individual. But here comes the uniqueness of the liver, where if at all there is a person who needs liver, and then my liver is compatible in all ways to be donated. Uh, there, there could be 30% of the liver that can be chopped from me and then transplanted into another individual. Well, 30, 20 to 30% of the liver is enough for a person. And then the liver has the capacity to regenerate and form a full-fledged liver in another individual. So regeneration is one of the unique feature of liver, which makes it amazing, wonderful, you know, totally unique from all the other organs in the body. So all of you agree that liver is great because of its regenerating property? I think so. I think so, Divya. So now we can reframe what a liver says. It says make it, break it or regenerate. Regenerate it. <laughs> right? So it's covering everything. It's encompassing yeah. everything. Yeah. So that's one of the favorite uh, feature of the liver of mine. And then I'm so proud to be involved in liver research. Okay, so, so let's um, have a quick quiz probably in the next slide. Okay, so how correctly you answer and how fast you answer. The first question, liver is the largest internal organ in the human body. Is it true or false? Largest internal, internal organ. organ. Yeah, guys, think, think this through. Yeah. So there's one trick. It's not the largest organ. 
agree so those of you who said true you're right it is the largest internal organ in the human body okay so exactly. if if at all i change the question to which is the largest organ in the human body what will be your answer skin yes somebody answer Absolutely. skin janavi yes you're yes, right yes yes so and all uh, of you are that are skin happens to be signs. very good and attending tts and skin yes. happens to be my favorite organ because we yes. study with the infection <laughs> yeah so. that's one of that, that's that's one of the reason i asked them the question so you should be familiar with skin because you are with karishma for the past two years almost <laughs> yeah. yes exactly i think so i think so very nice yes. okay. skin is the right answer for the largest organ in the human body so moving to the next question which one of these sentences is correct about labor it is not a vital organ it can regenerate itself liver is rectangular in shape so a b or c great my job is done so i've conveyed about liver to the best because all of you are answering correctly it is b it is a vital organ therefore a is wrong it can regenerate itself and hence b is right liver is rectangular in shape no river is a cone shaped or wedge shaped okay so all great job Great. So Did all you, of you have answered may, correctly. As you can see, so many bees, so many yes, bees. Yes, yes, and crazy. they're so fast. <laughs> yes, we have to struggle to keep up. Yeah, by Even the by the of... time I note the name, it's just jumping from <laughs> one to one. <laughs> That, yes, Divya, yes, I agree. That's TTS for you. Yeah. So Divya, a couple of questions, and now I can't even find them in this chat window with oh over hundred <laughs> messages. Oh, sorry. But, about okay, that. guys. Okay, guys. Just slow down. Just slow yeah. down. Okay, let's we'll stop down. it for let's now. Slow. Okay, let's yeah, pick up uh, a couple of questions. Uh, one question, I think Anirudh asked is this regenerate, making protein, breaking toxins. Does only the liver do this? Is liver the only organ that can do this in the body? No, there are other organs which does it, breaking and making. But liver is the organ where more of the carbohydrate, all the all of the metabolism takes place in the liver. Whereas protein, carbohydrate, there are separate liver like muscles where proteins are made, proteins are broken down. But liver, all the three metabolisms are involved: be it carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Okay, okay. So like other organs are more specific for yeah, protein. Yeah. So today I am a little, uh, you know, very mean in talking only yeah. about liver. So yeah. don't take me wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, no, not at all. Uh, well, it's a mean organ. You know what yeah. I mean. It it it, 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 it plays some important functions. So Ala asks this great question: Why is the liver only able to regenerate and not other organs? See, because in the lab we can grow even kidney on a dish, brain on a dish. We have managed to do that. But why in the transplant setting is the liver the only one that regenerates? I think that's the gift nature has given to liver because it has the cells. Uh, the stem cells that are needed for regeneration, which can happen in the okay. human body. So there's no other specific, uh, you know, thought which I can come up because uh, the stem cells that are needed for the regeneration, like thirty percent of liver, is enough for it to completely regenerate. And one example okay. is uh, if I, I think if I can make the young minds more active. If you, I mean, all of us are familiar with uh, the superstar Amitabh Bachchan, right? Right. So I think right. he had uh, liver transplantation because one of his movie, I think, during Shole, he had hepatitis C infection through a blood transfusion. Okay. So yes, so that's uh, where he had a lot of uh, because of the hepatitis C infection, his liver had damage, and once I think I a certain part of the liver was removed, and hence the entire uh, liver. I mean, to give a live example. Whom all of us are familiar with. So this is what I think Abhishekmat asked. What do you mean by needs the liver? This is the kind of scenario when one needs a liver, right? You have yes. liver damage because of an infection. That's or... right. Because um, the the liver damage can happen. I think I'll talk to you. I'll talk about it. You um, know, um, in future slides. Sure. Uh, there sure. are different uh, ways. Or factors that are responsible for the liver damage. If there is certain liver, you know, certain portion of the liver getting damaged, you can chop it out. But if the entire liver is damaged and there is, you know, no way that the liver can, you know, regain its function again, then liver transplantation is the option. I see. Okay. Yes, it is uh, a we... surgery for sure. Yes. 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 All right. We can move on and come back to more questions, Divya. 
So I gave you an overview of the importance of liver. Moving on to the core of the topic for today, it's fatty liver disease. What causes fatty liver disease will be the first question all of us would have. So for today's talk, I'll be focusing only on intake of excess calories, leaving apart all other causes. So just for you to understand, generally a broad characterization would be a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and alcoholic fatty liver disease. So the term itself is very clear. If a person consumes a lot of excess alcohol, then that results in liver damage and that is called as alcoholic fatty liver disease. Apart from that, the rest of the other factors that would cause fatty liver disease are termed as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So since we have only 45 minutes or so 40 to 55 minutes to discuss today, you know, summer holidays are coming, the amount of food we eat, the amount of exercise we put in, all this is very crucial for all of us, especially all the young minds who are getting ready for summer holidays. So today's talk will be only focused on the intake of excess calories. Okay, how does it play a role? So before, when I say intake of excess calories, let me explain you in a very simple way, calorie and energy balance. Okay, so that which is more related to the weight, weight maintenance. So the amount of calories that you intake from the food has to be lost in the form of the physical activity you perform, the energy gain and the energy, you know, let out has to be equalized that which is pertinent to the weight man, weight maintenance. So here, when you see the other picture, you see a non-obese person and an obese person. Okay. So here, let me explain you between the input and the output. So if, it, if you are taking healthy diet and it has adequate calorie intake, and then the same person has adequate physical activity. So there is a balance between the input and the output. And therefore, the person is lean or healthy or non-obese. While the other way around, where there is more input, meaning high fat, high carbohydrate diet taken, excess calorie, but the person is more as a sedentary lifestyle, meaning inadequate physical activity, more of sitting, watching TV, playing video games. Let's take it that way because most of us are on, on a similar path. So if the input is overweighing the output, there goes excess fat accumulation and the person becomes obese. Okay, if this concept is understood, I can move on further. Um, I think it's quite simple, yeah. but my, it's, it's a simple concept, Divya. But if I know young people, it's, they can understand it. They may not want to acknowledge it. <laughs> so there okay. is a fine difference. Uh, yes, so yes. Are there any questions about this, guys? Basically, input has to equal output. If output. input is not output, it's going to cause weight gain. <laughs> And too much output and not input is also not a good situation. Situation, right? yes. So that will be yes. underweight. Underweight, so, exactly. So always we have, we need to have a balance either it in nature or human body that, you know, metabolic balance is very critical. Very good. And there are challenges to this in our new lifestyle, Divya. Yes. Two years of lockdown. Lockdown, yes. From home, no sports. And now summer vacation. Summer vacation. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to take this, Divya, that we planned this session with all of this in mind. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. We can move on. I don't think there are any more questions, but okay. we can move on. Yes. Okay. So when we talk about obese and non-obese, um, you know, individuals, before that, we have to understand what do you mean by balanced? So what is healthy body composition? Okay. By research, you know, we all know that human body with male and female varies because of the hormones and other biological, uh, you know, variability. But generally, this is a standard that has been defined that 45% has to be muscle tissue. You know, there are certain criteria or, you know, specific percentage of these tissues and, uh, um, you know, fat, bone and other organs that have to be there. So, with that known, there should be in you know, a certain amount of water, fat, mineral, proteins, all this which makes up the human body. And this is the healthy body composition. So for all of us to be you know, aware of. When I talk about obese or obesity, the first question which comes to our mind is then what, what do you mean to be healthy, right? So this is how the composition or human body composition would be. Yeah, next slide. So here comes obesity. How do 
scientifically we define obesity okay there's a tool or an yardstick where you know the body mass index it's a simple calculation bmi for weight divided by height you know multiplied by 2 so this is for adults let me give you this uh, you know this this is the criteria which has been set for adults so underweight there is based on the weight based on the height of an individual they had there's a calculation done and you know there is a numerical characterization like less than 18.5 the person is characterized as underweight 18.5 to 25 normal 25 to 30 overweight 30 to 35 obese so this is just a tool okay which clinicians use or the lab uses to determine the bmi All right, Divya. There's a yeah. good question. Some mm -hmm. questions on BMI. Yes. First, Tashvi asks, "What is non-essential fat?" In this slide, we said essential versus non-essential fat. Okay, the essential fat are the one which are required for your metabolism. Non-essential fat is the storage fat, the you know the subcutaneous fat that is needed because mm -hmm. fat is also involved where you have uh, you know for thermal protection. When it is cold, you don't feel that extreme cold because of the fat that is acting as uh, the insulation. so that amount of fat which is stored for insulation is termed as non essential fat meaning which is not involved in the metabolic process okay okay so like the fat covering the heart lung heart, abdomen yes. is all essential that yes. is the metabolic but the one that is below our skin etc is non essential so when you need energy fat metabolism happens because fat also gives energy so th those are essential fats non essential fat technically are under the skin where it is stored for insulation insulation okay then um, um divya anirudh asks mm -hmm. can the liver lessen the effect of the fat you are eating because we say the liver breaks down fat right it's involved in fat metabolism yeah, so can I'll, the liver i'll tell i'll explain you i think you are <laughs> right on spot so maybe in the next couple of slides if you wait for five more minutes i can explain fantastic fantastic i think all of and them are so curious my goodness <laughs> yes yes they are waiting they are waiting to get to the end i think this, this is a topic <laughs> which you are closely relating to i think all of your parents are going to be more happy so summer holidays all of you are going to really put on efforts uh, understanding about it absolutely um divya the other question is daksha asks about saturated and unsaturated fat yes so uh, how uh, Okay, let, let let me explain that also in the future slides when talking okay. about healthy food and junk food. So all Great. of them are on Great. no no on spot. Yes. Yeah, and we'll take one more question and then move on. Avisha okay. asks, would anything happen to the liver if you don't eat in any enough food? I think it, it applies that... yeah generally to all the organs because underweight, unhealthy. You know, you need enough energy to sustain well. So if you don't yes. eat healthy food, obviously you will be unhealthy. you know that's yeah. what we were talking about having a balance you know balanced diet balanced lifestyle you know balanced exercise anything exactly. is always balance <laughs> exactly exactly okay all right so yes over overeating of excess calorie can also damage the liver and lack of calories can also damage the liver as any other organ yes okay so, so i don't have the, enough energy that you can sustain yeah correct uh, so i think the message if we are here is that this is relating to health more yes. than body mass index or weight yeah. being a number that's right that's exactly health. what i want to say in the future slide right perfect so it's going to come yeah. to that okay yes. so let's move on all right we'll ask more questions uh, subsequently okay so this is um again we spoke about tools so this would be telling you for you know for the age of 2 to 20 okay so this is how the percentile has been defined for example let me tell you my own example you can uh, you know correlate it or calculate your own bmi that's the reason i put this up so i have a daughter who is 5 years old so the age is defined here and the body weight is defined here so this is the age so this is irrespective of the height okay because it's a growth phase each kid would have is our own uh, you know um, growth uh, phase so here is the uh, kilogram and here is the uh, age here if you take up the height and other stuff so depending on how height and here if you go with correlated to the weight 
you can define whether you are you have an healthy weight or overweight okay so this is just a yardstick just remember that it tells you about whether you are you know whether you have a healthy weight or whether you are overweight but doesn't say everything about your health so this is something which i want to remember which i want you all to remember it's just a tool it would give an indication to you that you have a you know you are a little overweight you're a little obese so you can you know you try to have a balanced diet and exercise and then reduce your weight on that part so there's nothing that it would say no you are hanel so this is something which you have to remember it's just a tool which gives an indication that you know this is not good absolutely and divya some of our young minds anirudh noticed very mm -hmm. astutely that our boys are weighing more than girls but i would also point out that it's after a certain age that's right so uh, if you see a 5 year old girl example of your daughter and a 5 year old boy, boy they should both be 15 to 20 kilos 15 to 20 kilos right divya am i right yes, about yes yeah yeah you're right i think that's how the percentile varies across the kids i think comparatively the growth phase of a boy versus the girl varies and therefore right. the bar also varies this is why it is different for boys versus the girls and you notice the difference is happening majorly at 10 10 onwards 10 to 12 yes. onwards yes and within Where boys suddenly... also the growth phase is different some boys you know grow very fast i've heard the parents talking about it in schools yeah yeah exactly okay all right but well caught anirudh that's a good observation yes good observation okay we'll move on divya okay So quiz time back again. Obesity is caused when more calories are consumed than burned. Agree? Yes, 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 yes. Answer is good. Okay. So you are making my job easy, and I'm you know this gives me more confidence that I can communicate to you all of you very well. Okay, which I am not actually not good as Karishma, but no, no, not working. at all. You 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 are killing it. Uh, I mean, I'm here after hundred sessions. This is your first session, so okay. you're totally doing it a great job. Thank you. So all of you are right. It's true. Next question: Obesity in a person refers to excess of muscles, bones, fat, and water. Wow! 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 Okay. All of you well are right. Well done. Well done. done. Well done. Yeah. So the next question. Oh, sorry. Okay, this this is something which you, you may not be familiar, but still, uh, I just wanted to let you know: one pound of fat equals how many calories? Just a wild guess. Let's see how many of you can guess. Uh, B is two thousand five hundred. Abai, okay. Somebody says thousand three thousand five hundred. Okay, thousand five hundred. Okay, so somebody who guessed three thousand five hundred, you're right. so though it is a wild guess because this is some this is not something which we are more familiar with so 1 pound of fat equals 3500 calories imagine when if you have to burn 1 pound of fat you have to burn out 3500 excess calories in order to reduce 1 pound of fat in your body okay that's intense divya yes. that's intense <laughs> you know what i'm thinking you know what i'm thinking the next time i do tts i'm going to be on a treadmill okay Like I mean, that one hour, three thousand five hundred calories is not going to be burnt, but at least whatever. Yeah. That's, so that's all of us are not familiar with the numbers. So I just wanted to convey you, like you know, eating and gaining weight is easy, but losing weight is the most challenging part. So we'll have to have a calorie deficit of three thousand five hundred to but lose one pound of no fat. fat. That's pretty yes. intense. Yes. That to think about it, right? Like yeah. wow, wow, guys. Uh, <laughs> next week I'm on a treadmill. Okay. <laughs> all right. Just, just be mentally prepared. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's move on to fatty liver disease now. So, which for which all of you are interested, and why am I here today? So, before uh, telling you how liver gets fatty, let me explain you. You know, give you a simple example or give you basic information about uh, these two important uh, factors. One is subcutaneous fat. I think if you understand the difference between this, you'll be able to understand the whole concept. So, I'll be done with my job successfully. So this is subcutaneous fat. As you see here, this fat is above the abdominal cavity. I think you can relate it if you have seen obese people. Okay, so if the fat deposition is more in the subcutaneous here in the region above the abdominal cavity, it is called subcutaneous fat. 
Whereas visceral fat is something inside the abdominal cavity. So you, if you see the picture, visceral fat is more closely associated with all your internal organs. Okay. So let me explain you. Here is a cross-sectional figure. Okay. So this is a person who is very healthy, has a normal weight. So this is the subcutaneous fat. And here is the visceral fat. So here, if you see the picture, there is enough or sufficient amount of subcutaneous fat and the required amount of visceral fat. What happens if this individual takes in high calorie food but doesn't exercise or lack physical activity? So if you see obese people, there are two types of obesity. One is subcutaneous obesity. If just in case, if, I, if some of you missed when I was talking about visceral fat, let me explain it once more here. It, there are two types of obesity. One is subcutaneous obesity and the other is visceral obesity. When I say subcutaneous obesity, this individual will have more fat deposition in the subcutaneous region. That is about the abdominal cavity here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can see here there is high amount of fat deposition in the subcutaneous region, whereas the visceral region, there is only the required amount, that, which means the normal. So this is called a subcutaneous obesity. Visceral obesity, on the other hand, Yes, if you see the figure here, if you see an if you see this individual, it is very clear to you. There is intense deposition in the visceral region below the abdominal cavity where there is fat excess fat accumulation, whereas the subcutaneous fat is a little more, but comparably very less compared to visceral obesity. So with that said, you have two types of obesity, subcutaneous obesity. Here the person is obese, but the liver is mm. heavy. Whereas in the visceral obesity, where all the internal organs are accumulated with fat, that leads to fatty liver. How does this lead to fatty liver? Okay, let's see. Okay, Dhea, you want to stop for questions now or yeah. we continue? Okay. We can I, can, I think I can explain the next slide and take up all the questions. I'm sure they may be having questions related to this. So how does liver get fatty will be the question, right? I said there is excess liver, you know, fat deposition in the visceral region. How does this happen? I'm not going to talk to you about all the metabolic reactions that happen, but explaining you very simple, this high calorie overload, as we saw. So this are, these are your fat cells. So there are two different processes that happen. One is hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Okay, this is the healthy cell. So any of you can just answer when you see, when I say hypertrophy, what changes do you see in the cells? In hypertrophy, what in changes hypertrophy. do we see? Okay. Is um, it okay? Uh, I think Ala, yeah, Alia, right? Um, yes, Ala. Yes, yes. Ala. Uh, you're right. I think hypertrophy, you can see that the size has been increased. There are three cells, so but the size of the three cells has been increased. That's called hypertrophy. Whereas hyperplasia, on the other hand, hyperplasia. Yeah, you can is... keep moving. Uh, okay, 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 sure. So here, what changes do you see in hyperplasia? More cells, yes. That, there you go, Gamar Daksh. So yes. healthy cell, yes. if there is increase in the size, we call this as hypertrophy. Whereas increase in the number, we call it as hyperplasia. Simply explaining you in a... You know, without going deep into the metabolism. So all the fat cells would increase in size as well as increase in number. What happens then? If there is increase in number and size, anything, you know, there is a capacity to hold. But if, if this capacity is overloaded by the fat, the fat cells get into the circulation and then it goes deposit into the liver. When fat cells get deposited into the liver, simple, liver gets fatty which means the liver is getting fatty liver, the liver, the healthy liver becomes a fatty liver. So very in a simple way to explain to you without any metabolism and what, there is increase in the number of the fat cell, increase in the size of the fat cell, whereas visceral obesity increases, the fat cells gets into the blood circulation and then reaches liver, the healthy liver gets converted to a fatty liver. Okay, so it's basically Divya like you have all these fat cells which are fat, and many, and they need a place to go. 
Yes. And for different scientific reasons, they end up in the liver and say, oh, we found a nice home now. We yeah, they also for- end up in other organs if somebody has that question. But again, we are talking only about liver here. Right now. Okay. Yeah. So Divya, let's take some more questions. So okay. one thing is, um, uh, I believe it was uh, someone asked, uh, did you not understand visceral fat? Maybe we can just use this picture to explain oh, yeah. that. You know? So visceral, the fat cells are the same. Okay. I'm not telling there are different types of fat cells. Okay. It is just the deposition of fat. Which region is the fat depositing? If it is above this abdominal cavity here, it's called uh, below the skin. It's called hmm. subcutaneous fat. If it is hmm. inside, I mean, associated internally, um, covering up the organs, where in close proximity with the organ, that's called as the visceral fat. Visceral. It's nothing like there are different type of fat cells. There are same fat cells, but uh, they are divided or characterized based on the deposition or the location in which or where they are deposited. So, Daksha asks a great question. Can somebody have both types of fat, visceral and subcutaneous? Yes, that's, uh, I'll answer you in the next slide. Divya, these people are asking like, Grad, grad school level. That's questions. right. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of surprised because I was, you know, when preparing slide, I was like, how do I convey without metabolism? You know, I really had to put in a lot of effort. I was like, oh my yes. God, preparing for TTAs is really challenging because you have to make simple concept but explain it to them. But I think even if I have put metabolism concept, they would have easily grabbed it. But it also tells you, Divya, right now you're the expert in fatty liver disease in India, but you have competition. Oh, there's a tough competition with yes. clinicians. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. All right. So then uh, Tashli asks, how do we know we have fatty liver disease? How does one know? Yes. Okay. I'm probably uh, down the lane. Can I explain that? Uh, sure. And that asks, is there any lab test? Yes, yes, you can tell us about that. Yes. And Tashvi also asked this puberty. So this is the last question we'll take for now. Does mm-hmm. puberty affect the liver? Uh, I'm not very sure about it. I don't want okay. to give a wrong answer. So yes, okay. Uh, Prob- it, it probably shouldn't. I, I'm, yeah, sh- shouldn't. I'm not sure either. So yeah. All so right. uh, okay. Yes, somebody can have both types of fats together, and we display visceral yes, yes. fats. Okay. Okay. So we can then move on for yeah, now. Yeah, move on. Yes. Mm-hmm. So maybe next slide, all of I mean, I can clearly describe you the different types and where you can. Uh, so this one, you can just um, put in all the information. Uh, so this this is metabolically healthy in a normal weight. Okay, so we were talking here, metabolically healthy obese and then metabolically unhealthy obese. So in obese, we have two types, okay? This is just to define in terms, uh, maybe terminology wise, but scientifically not right. Let me say you that because when you're obese, you're obese. You know, there's nothing like healthy and unhealthy. When we characterize them into healthy and unhealthy, basically because unhealthy, there's a high risk. Okay. Healthy compared to unhealthy, not when compared to normal weight. They are healthy when compared to the unhealthy obese because These are also at the risk. So once you know that you are obese, it is always good to be careful and reduce the fat, which would really um, aid in reversing the fatty liver disease. So when here comes the picture, somebody was asking, you know, some can any can uh, people have both subcutaneous, you know, obesity and visceral? Yes, visceral obesity. You know, people who don't have much of visceral obesity maybe can be characterized here. They have a lot of subcutaneous obesity. Though they are obese, they are still healthy. Okay, giving an indication that after a certain amount of time, you may also start developing visceral obesity. Okay, but here who is unhealthy has both subcutaneous as well as more of visceral obesity. So this person is highly at risk. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. We can come back to that question again, but we do understand that neither are optimum states, neither are normal, but one is moderate risk and one is high risk. High risk, yes. So, absolutely. Okay. High risk for fatty liver disease. Fatty liver okay. disease, yes. Okay. So I'm talking to you so much about fatty liver disease. Why is it important? The recent estimate in 2020 by Zydus says almost 400 million Indians are at risk. Okay. These are adults. The same survey says 
childhood obesity is the ticking time bomb because globally one in 10 children are found to be obese i i'm sure all of you know the reason why you know childhood obesity is increasing because physical activity is reducing more of a, more of the kids are in front of the tv laptop or um, you know video games less of physical activity high of junk food less of healthy food okay but here if you see we were just talking about liver getting fatty if you don't take care of your liver at the right time that would lead progressively lead to cancer and that's why you have to be careful take precautions right on time to reverse the fatty liver disease okay that's let me talk about reversing fatty liver disease okay sounds good divya shall we move on yeah so basically we are saying almost what 50% of indians are at risk yes or... and i think we were talking about the lap tests now i'm sitting and talking to you i may be totally unaware that i have a fatty liver disease because i'm metabolically healthy but a time comes where i start noticing diabetes or any other i mean the i think one of the major drawback in india is until we are you know we have a problem we don't get lap tests done exactly. unlike the other countries where health insurance health insurance is recently coming into play in india but you know maybe 5 10 years back we never heard about health insurance it was you know very very few but now health insurance is becoming you know a must so in other countries they get lab tests routinely done at least a yearly health checkup so that you know some for some test can determine whether you have a fatty liver disease or not but in india until and unless we have problem we don't go get lab tests done so maybe that's the reason why we say that they are risk and as someone was asking about the lab test yes liver enzymes are measured ast and alt so that also gives a sign that there's a problem in the liver these enzymes are elevated in the liver so those are simple lab tests that are done when when the enzymes are elevated that's one step but then that doesn't guarantee that you have a fatty liver disease and then you know clinicians go further to get ultrasound done um other uh, you know uh, plasticity elastoplasticity and other determination of the you know scanning procedures that are done to determine whether you have a fatty liver disease biopsies are done sometime when they confirm through ultrasound where they pick out a pinch of liver and subject it to the stain to determine the amount of fat so they would do histology test and see you know how much of fat cells are accumulated in the liver the liver so uh, there are lots of good questions one thing they ask do children measure liver enzymes and the answer i think is usually the pediatric checkup annually yes. once a year does it does otherwise it. you will measure if you are at risk like you are visibly obese or yeah, obese, you yes. have uh, early diabetes etc yeah so unfortunately we don't have pediatric hepatologist or in generally if i have to sum the percentage of you no know, we have gastroenterologist in common in india whereas very yeah. few are hepatologist and pediatric hepatologist is totally not in india unlike in the united states we have epito- you know pediatric hepatologist specifically Correct. treating um, you know this little uh, ignorance or lack of you know knowledge is also a problem in india very true and what your session has enlightened us all is we have always thought liver disease equals alcohol and that almost always lead excludes young people right yes obviously it means that your lifestyle which is your exercise food And food exercise food has such a big role to play in liver health yes. even at a young age and i think it's so important to drive this i think for this, this session talking to the young minds yes food yes. and your lifestyle is yes. very very important very important and bhargavi at 9 years says she doesn't drink alcohol which we are all very happy to hear Yes. that's wonderful bhargavi <laughs> all right that's very cute also um, so then abhay asked how do we measure liver enzymes they are measured in the blood blood yes rarely do you remove liver tissue or do a biopsy or something that, which is rare the, that's at the very rare scenario so initial test is the blood test that's very it. simple um, yeah two more questions divya ala yes. asked she wants to ex- see what's happening to the liver in this slide but we'll do that question but before that duck says is there any machine to remove fat laser machine to remove fat uh no all these uh, you know different agencies which we have you know working on uh, weight reduction colors and some of the you know <laughs> i think yeah. that's where these uh, terminology come fat removal treatment unfortunately not right not yeah oh, you know there yeah. is always a healthy way to get it out so i think um, rather spending a lot of money and um, going there i think it's good you get into your good lifestyle 
yes, that would exactly. be a good way to reduce your weight. Sounds good. And then we'll uh, we'll move on after you just explain this uh, progression yes. of liver. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so here I think uh, one of you, Daksha, uh, you uh, wanted me to explain about the stages here. This is a simple, you know, cartoon image. So this is the healthy liver. The color, as I said, it is usually reddish brown. But when it when there is a lot of fat accumulation, the liver color changes. Okay, it's more because you know fat cells are accumulating, so you know they slightly become a little yellowish in color. But here there is a lot of inflammation happening. Most of the uh, majority of the uh, cells which are found in the liver are hepatocytes. Here there is death of the hepatocytes happening. In, so I didn't go into the metabolism detail. So I'll explain you in simple terms. There is a lot of inflammation, tissue scarring, where I mean hepatocytes get killed, whereas stellate cells start occupying. So there are very few, you know, major 85% are hepatocytes. 5% are stellate cells, endothelial cells, Kufur cells, which are macrophages in the liver. But gradually what happens because of the inflammation is that hepatocytes numbers reduces, whereas stellate cells keep growing. And that would start ca causing fibrosis. Where I mean, I think the simple way to tell you is, you know, this is very smooth and a flexible organ. Gradually, what progressively what happens is become very stiff, you know, because of the fibrosis. Uh, maybe a thick sponge where you can't even tease out, pull it, that flexibility of the organ is lost. So they become, they get scary. And because of all the, you know, unwanted metabolic activities taking place in the liver, that will lead to cancer. Is that um, simple to understand? Yes, the liver gets stiff and hard. Somebody was uh, pointing it out. Great. Thank, Thank you. That was Good. Allah who asked that. Okay. Great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Allah. So the next question, so this we can go step by step, maybe, uh, Karishma. Okay. okay. So is fatty liver disease reversible? I think unknowingly I did answer it for you. But let's go through this and you can answer me whether it is reversible or not. So this is a recent book that got published by Dr. Rita Lippe, who is a pediatric hepatologist in the United States. Okay. So a very simple book, but very informative. Uh, you know, everything explained very pictorially. So this is Jerome, who is. So here is a group of friends, Jerome, Junior, Charlie and Henry. OK, note down the you know faces or uh, so that you can identify who is uh, Henry, who is Charlie and who is Junior in the next picture. So can anyone point out the food they are eating? Who is eating healthy food and who is eating junk food? So first point I have to ask all of you is how do you define healthy food and junk food? Because I've heard my daughter telling French fries is junk, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's junkish healthy food. <laughs> yeah, it's okay so, once in a while. That's what she says. Once in a while comes like once in a week. Um, yes. All right. So uh, Divya, we'll just keep a check on time. Okay, but so I think let me, quickly. let me, yeah, I think uh, rather than ask, uh, asking them to answer, I can just move ahead and they can, uh, you know, based on the talk, they can say what is right and wrong. So here is the next picture. I think I'll stop asking question because, um, you know, there's, um, I mean, because of the time constraint. If you see here in the first picture, Junior is the one who is eating a junk food, pizza here, whereas others are eating healthy food. Jerome is eating, you know, a sa I mean, a sandwich. The rest are using, uh, you know, fruits and um, regular fruit drink and others. If you see in the next picture, Jerome, can, uh, Charlie and Henry are very active in playing, whereas Junior is sitting. I think after a certain period of time, Junior would, will be diagnosed that he, is, he has fatty liver because of few of the symptoms he would have and also diabetes. So once he is diagnosed, doctor advises him to this sort of lifestyle. The first lifestyle where he stops eating the junk food, okay, and switches over to healthy food. Fruits, plenty of water, vegetables, okay, and the next life, somebody is there, the fun and the active lifestyle, TTAs, yes. And Ch Junior also starts playing. Can you see the reduction in the body weight? So this is Charlie, this is Jerome, and this is Henry, and here comes the Junior. So as you see in the picture, Junior, by the switch in the lifestyle, in his food habits, from obese is turned to lean, a healthy weight. So so 
So now, is fatty liver reversible? I would. What, what What would everyone say? Is fatty liver reversible? Is there something we can do about it? Yeah. Let's see. If you answer me okay. correctly, then I'm great. Yeah. I can. I can. <laughs> you can. Yes. I can. Okay. That's great. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. The message is conveyed very, you know, correctly. Yes. Fatty liver disease is reversible. And so that's the good news, all, right? Yeah, all yes, that's and and that's why I think that's the beauty of liver. You know, mm. liver is an amazing organ at the same time a forgiving organ. No matter how much you trouble liver, it has its limit. It it tolerates and tolerates only gives you trouble at the end. It tries its best to keeps you healthy. Okay, so this is all about fatty liver disease. Coming on to what we do in our lab. Okay, quickly. Um, so. This is exactly how research is done in the lab, especially in my lab where we focus on fatty liver disease. Okay, as you see in the picture, we also give mice two different types of diet: healthy diet and unhealthy diet. So this is something which you know pictorially telling this is a healthy diet of humans and this is an unhealthy diet of humans, but that's not the way we give it for the mice. Healthy diet here is the dietitian or the scientist would come up. With a protocol of you know what amount of carbohydrate, protein, fat has to be given in a proportion, and that's that is what we term it as chow diet for mice. And here we have the colorful westernized diet, wherein it has rich in high fat, high carbs, and that's termed as unhealthy diet or high fat diet for mice. Okay, so if that is understood, so there are different diets which mimics human diet. Let me put it in that way. So we don't put them uh, French fries or cookies. Rather, we have the diet which replicate or mimic the human diet, and this is how exactly the experiments are carried out in the lab. So this is the cage. If you see from the overview, there would all there would be a water bottle, and this is the cage, and this portion is where the diet is placed. So here you see the mice um, having its diet, and here will be the water bottle where it can drink water. So Right, and the water bottle will be filled with normal water. Whereas when we take the other set of mice, it is a high-fat diet, which is rich in high carbs, fat. When compared to the chow diet, and in no, and in the water bottle, what we do is we put sugar water. Sugar water meaning we mix glucose and uh, fructose, so that mimicking the Coke. Okay, this is a McDonald diet. Let me put it in that way. So this will be your French fries, burger, and other stuff, and this would be a Coke. So this is how the mice behave. If you feed them regular diet, normal water, you can see the weight of the mouse. The liver looks very healthy and beautiful. You can see the color of the liver. Histology, you can see a healthy hepatocyte. Versus when we feed them on high fat diet, they become obese. Very similar to human. The liver gets fatty. I think this is a very natural picture. Uh, if Ala was asking about the coloration, so this is how you know because of the deposition of the fat, the coloration is different. The size of the liver increases, and if you see the histology figure, here you go. Compared to all the hepatocytes, all the fat cells take over the hepatocytes. There is increased amount of fat cells in the histology figure. So this is how we study um, you know fatty liver disease in the lab. Uh, so. Uh, in the lab, you know, for fatty liver disease, mice, rat, guinea pigs are widely used because they mimic um, uh, human uh, physiology. Okay, so this is a very fact. What is happening? Seventy-four percent of children don't get enough daily exercise. I hope all of you agree on that. And most of us, you know, the average child now consumes twenty teaspoons of sugar. It's not literally taking spoon in the sugar, but you start drinking your Coke and you know sugar in different forms. Which is almost ten six times more than the recommended, and here is a cartoon which you know very clearly depicts our state of mind. When pizza, oh my God, you enjoy to the best, but if your mom gives you salad, oh, it takes a long time for her to convince you to feed you the salad. So that is how you know more of us are more inclined to unhealthy diet versus the healthy diet. Okay. So somebody says that's me, Shri Hari. So you are uh, more into French fries and burgers. Okay. Well, who? Yeah. Yeah. So let's have a quiz time. So if all of you answer this correctly, 
you know, I have to pat my shoulders. Uh, flavored drinks are filled with sugar, which is bad for our health. Which one would you choose to have instead? A can of cola, a glass of water, a bottle of lemonade. B or C? Lemonade, again, you have lemon and then you add sugar, okay? So nobody drinks lemonade, just squeezing lemon into water. So you have sugar in it. That's all for old people like us, Divya. Yeah. Just lemon and water, <laughs> not for young people. So lemonade is something which is out of your list. I, I think I can get that now. Yes, yes. So ideally so I, B, right? Yeah, ideally B. So you have to drink enough amount of water to keep yourself healthy. So what should you do to have a healthy diet? When I say healthy diet, should you keep eating the same thing again and again? Or eat same thing every day? Eat a lot of food when I say healthy diet or eat different types of food? D. A, B, C, D. Okay, that's where well, there you go. All of you are right. So eat different types of food. I don't say don't eat French fries, don't eat burgers, don't eat pizza. Okay, that I would be a bad mom then. Okay, forget about being a scientist. My daughter is my my daughter would literally be hating me to the core. <laughs> eat, you know, eat pizza, eat burger, but there is a limit for it. Okay, once in a month, absolutely, you're totally fine. Enjoy the food, and on part that you have enough physical activity. You know, enjoying that physical activity and being active is the key. Okay, so different types of vegetable, different types of fruits, different types of food, everything. So. The healthy lifestyle will always lead to healthy liver. This is something very important. And the beauty of liver is that it's a very forgiving organ. You know, it's unlike other organs, if you damage it, it quickly reacts and then you have no solution to make it healthy. Whereas liver, fatty liver, you can still reverse it. Given that you improve your diet, have a healthy lifestyle, eat good food, healthy food, and then have more physical activity. So less of your TV, Less of your screen time in different you know, ways you use it and then have good amount of sleep. So all this is important because more the screen time, I'm sure it less amount of sleep. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Thank all right. Thank you so much. All of you being so active and with full of questions and enthusiasm. So this is just a thank you slide. I'm not going to take much of my time. As Karishma already mentioned, I'm in Jesus Medical College myself. Uh, Akshita and Divakar are my PhD scholars who are actively participating in the lab for research. I'm in the biochemistry department. We have funding from DBT and ICMR. And of course, obviously, undoubtedly, I need to thank my mentors, Dr. Sanyal and uh, Dr. Karnam. Uh, without them, I think I wouldn't have been here. The master students who keep rotating for dissertation and all these supportive collaborators across India and uh, abroad. Thank you so much, overwhelming. So much of question. I hope yes. your summer holidays are going to be very healthy summer holidays. <laughs> okay? At least you've given them <laughs> unintended food for thought. Okay, so now you have to promise that you have understood, you know, how people get obese, you know, how healthy you have to keep your liver. As the Chinese proverb says, once you have learned something, I think now the mor moral obligation is on you that you keep spreading this news for me. <laughs>